Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. Data entry is one of the most basic things we do in Excel, and it can be tedious at times. But there are some techniques, shortcuts, and a feature called autofill that will greatly assist. Before we begin, let's open our Excel workbook. We are in module 201. There's a slider bar with a black rectangle in the lower right hand corner. You can zoom in or out by holding down the left mouse button. We're only going to use about seven columns as we will create a small little worksheet so let's just zoom in a bit let me enter some information in cell a3 i can use the arrow keys or click on a3 and make that cell the active one and i type revenue have you noticed it's on the left hand side of the cell Unless you type values, that is what automatically happens in Excel. Moving down a column, I'll type in costs and then hit enter and profit. Enter. Later on, I decide to change the word costs to expenses. I'll click there. We don't need to erase it. I'll simply type over it. To edit a cell, either click on it and then go into the formula bar, click in the appropriate spot and make some changes or double click near the entry to do the editing directly in the cell. I'm going to enter some numbers. The number I'm going to type is 80 and I accidentally typed O instead of zero. Have you noticed that on the keyboard, they're right next to each other? I tab over one, three, zero, correctly typing this one tab and you can see the difference when entering numbers in excel they're always right aligned let's just go through this again eight zero if it is not purely numerical or a formula excel will left align it whereas numbers are always right aligned okay i'm going to enter four numbers and then press the tab as i moved to the right here so i'll type two two five tab 300 zero zero, tab 325 tab 500 and then press enter after the last entry then six more numbers here and then after the last one press enter i'm going to put monthly names across the top so I'll start by typing January and then I tab over. Now let me give you a time saving tip. It's an autofill shortcut. When you have a month spelled out or a three letter abbreviation, you can point to the fill handle in the lower right hand corner of that cell. Take note of how the mouse pointer changes shape and becomes thinner. I'm dragging across while holding down the left mouse button. The little pop-ups below hint at what's to come. You will get the remaining months. We can drag on until December and then it'll start over. Or we can leave it as is. We can also accomplish this in a variety of ways. You may begin with any month and may use a three-letter abbreviation. So let me type in O C T and then I'll point to the lower right hand corner and click and drag you've probably already guessed what we are about to see the same thing happens if you drag right we can go downwards you get used to this feature pretty quickly it also works with the weeks of the year we can also use the letter q and the number one in a variety of ways Q means quarter in financial terms. So if I just type in Q1 over here and I drag downwards, it goes all the way to Q4. Remember, there are four quarters in a year. You can also go rightwards. Of course, these are frequently used for columns and row headings. 
So these are pretty useful techniques. Let's look at another example. So we have another data set over here. If we want to delete some data, we can simply place the cursor inside the cell and press the delete key. You can also delete entire columns by highlighting the columns you want to delete and you can hit delete. You can clear everything by pressing the delete key. If you click over here and you hit the delete key, it's going to delete everything. When we talk about columns and rows, we'll learn how to handle all of that. I'm just making sure you understand how to delete data from cells right now. You can now copy data from cells as well. The simplest method is to use your keyboard shortcut. I'll start by copying everything. So let me select everything over here. Then I'll press the Control and C key. And then I'll hit the Control and V key to paste. And now I have a completely new copy of everything. Let's just reverse that. Another thing you can do is drag data. It can be much easier and faster at times. I'll select all of my text. And if I slowly move my cursor to the right edge of the data set, you might notice that the cursor changes to a crosshair. And all I have to do now is slide the data around. I could put it wherever I want. Maybe I'll just move it down a few rows. I can let go and everything will move. I can also slide it over and everything moves again. I like to tell you about a specific situation. In this data set, we have a very simple formula in column E, which is just adding these two numbers together for every line. When we copy everything, it preserves the formula. And when we paste it anywhere we want, the formula is going to be preserved. But if I just copy this column, and paste it, everything is blank. The formula doesn't work because your data will be considered absolute at times and your formulas will be considered relative at others. That is, they will be locked into where they are in a sheet at times and will move around at other times. In these cases, we can just paste the value of the formulas and result in because I don't really care about the formula. We're just moving data around. So I'll copy this data set and I'll paste it here as values. If there's a formula in a data set, what, and if we need to move the data set around, it's always best to copy and paste the data as values. So if we go in paste special over here, you have a paste values feature. So you click on that. And there we go. All right. In this module, we went through the concepts of viewing and entering data in Excel. We also discussed how to copy and delete data. Autofill and moving data using the crosshair cursor functionality can help save loads of time, especially when you are drowning in work. When it comes to formatting the appearance of an Excel spreadsheet, there are no rules. It depends on the type of data, who it is for, and how much time you have to devote to formatting it. There are numerous reasons. Let's have a look at a data set that we discussed in the previous module. Let's copy it across. And let's try to format it. So what we see over here is we have revenue and expenses for the months from January through June. So the first thing that we can do over here is we can type in financial data over here in cell A2. And in the font 
section, you will see that we have a number of options. So we can make it bold, we can italicize the text, and even underline it if we need to. The other thing is, when we talk about formatting cells, it needs to look neat. So we can select all the months, and we can align it by using the options that we have over here. If I click on this option, make sure the data is in the center of the cell. If I click on this option, it's going to align to the left side. We can even middle align the data set. So it really depends on what works for you and how does the data look on the spreadsheet. I usually prefer to center align the data, especially when we are looking at financial data. We can also make the data bigger or smaller. So if I select these line items, I can change the font size. I can make it smaller as well. And we can also change the color of the font. We can make it blue or orange or gray. So we have a number of options at our disposal. We can even color the cells. So let's go with this option for now. Let me share another interesting feature of Excel. You don't need to format the data by clicking on each and every cell. You can format the entire row by selecting the, the row number. So let's say we want to format row number four. We can change the color of the text in this row and we can make it red. And for revenue, we can change it to green. So the entire row of data updates based on what you want to do. It's also worth spending some time on the merge and center functionality. So let me copy and paste this data set over here. And instead of typing financial data in cell A8, I want to make sure that it's merged across these highlighted cells because at the end of the day, the data underneath is all financial data. So what I can do is I can select the cells where I want the financial data to be merged across. I go in the merge and center option and I click merge across. So as you can see, this data set is now merged, but in order to make it look a little nicer, I can center align it and there you go. This looks much better than this. It's far clearer. Let's now talk about the Excel data types and why they are important. This is an excellent example because it contains a wide range of data types. We have text, we have numbers, we have dates, and we even have some formulas. When you enter data into a cell, Excel does an excellent job of determining which data type to use. For instance, if I type in a word, let me type my own name, U-M-A-R, I'll press the Enter key and the text will remain its left aligned. This indicates that it is simply treating it as a text string. However, notice when I enter a number. I'll press the Enter key and the text will remain to the right. That is how Excel determines whether the field is a number or a value. That is, a date, an integer, a time, a currency, or any other type of value that isn't a straight text field. It's significant because it determines what kind of formula or function you can perform on that cell. For example, if I go to the formulas ribbon, let me click on this cell and go to the formulas ribbon. We have a number of options available. If I go in the financial formulas, these are all the formulas that I can perform using this data set. We can also perform various functions on text such as transforming text directly in a cell. You can perform calculations using date and time data as well. But Excel must understand what type of data set it's dealing with. And that's why the alignment within a cell helps Excel determine the data set. Let's look at these dates over here. Dates can be entered in a variety of ways. So let me type in 
a date, for example. As you can see, it's perfectly centered. In fact, if I go over to the formula bar, I can see that the date has been expanded. I have the year, I have the month, and I have the day. Excel will adjust the dates based on the locale you have selected. So let me look at a time as well. We can also enter time in a variety of ways. Let's say I enter 17.55 p.m. As you can see, it's right aligned once more. And if I look at the formula bar, we see the p.m. after the time. You always have the option of selecting and formatting the data cell that you want. So let's highlight this field over here. So amount. Let me go to the home ribbon tab. And over here, we can see that the formatting is set to general. This denotes the number format, and currently it's set to general. I can easily change it to currency, and the entire data set converts to currency automatically. I can also change the number of decimals used. The currently, the data shows two decimal places. If I click on this button, it will increase the number of decimals and clicking on the decrease decimal button is going to decrease the number of decimals. If you look at this column, the day since issue, there are some formulas in here, but these are very simple formulas. This cell, for example, denotes the number of days since the ticket number was issued. It's a simple formula that subtracts today's date from the value in this cell when the ticket number was issued. And these are the types of calculations that can be performed when the type is properly set. So keep an eye out in the back of your mind for anything that doesn't seem right. For example, I just typed in time, but it's left aligned. So it seems that Excel has not recognized that I was putting in time. However, if I put in a space over here, it's going to be right aligned again. Excel recognizes that it is indeed time and adjusts accordingly. We have a number of options available to format data and ensure that it's readable. We can also save valuable time if we understand the different data types and format accordingly. Formula writing is one of the most common things that Excel users do. Now, most formulas are clear, easy to understand, and simple to use, but they begin with an idea that might be new to you. On this sheet, we want to figure out how much money we made. So in January, if we subtract the expenses from the revenue, we're going to get the profit. So it's going to be 77 minus 47 and we get 30 in Excel. If we have a look at the formula, all formulas start with an equal sign. We can and sometimes do use external numbers, but most of the time we use addresses. In effect, we want to say that whatever is in B4 should be subtracted from B3. So we write the formula. And this is one of the three main ways to write a formula. We type the location of the first cell, B3 minus B4. We press enter or tab, and we have our answer. Another way to type this, so let me just delete it, is to use the arrow keys to get to the cell you want. This could be a better way to write a formula, but the cells have to be close together. So let's see how this works. So let's press equal, then we use the arrow key. We go up to B3, then I press minus, and we use the arrow key again to go up to B4. Press enter. We get the same answer, 30. And the third way, which might take two hands, is firstly to type equal, then we click on cell B3, type minus, then click on cell B4, press enter. We get the same solution in all three cases. 
No matter how you write the formula, you should learn to keep an eye on what we call the formula bar. This is the formula bar over here. You can see it at the top of the screen. In a way, the cell doesn't really have a number. It has a formula instead. You keep an eye on the formula bar, much like we keep an eye on a rear view mirror when we are driving. We look at it often. Now we need a total in cell N3. If everything we knew about the formula came from what we had seen before, we would do something like this. Equal, let's click on B3, then add C3, then add D3, and so on. But it's not the best way to do it. Think about trying to do that for the entire year or if you had a lot more columns of data. Simply press Escape. Excel has hundreds of functions that come with it. A lot of them exist. You can find them this way on the Ribbons Formula tab. So we have some financial functions, some logical functions, text, data and time. The options are virtually endless. Most people probably use some the most when they use Excel. And just like a formula, this starts with the word equal, and then we type sum, S-U-M, and there's no need to capitalize it. Then we have left parenthesis, and then we select the cells in question by dragging from left to right. So I want the sum of these columns over here. All the cells from B3 are now included. Then we press Enter. And just like that, the answer comes up. In cell O3, we need to figure out the average. That is, of course, the total number divided by 12, as we have 12 months over here. We need to add up all of these, but the addition has already been done right here. So the formula in the average column is just equal. Then we click on this cell divided by 12 and press enter. Please note that the division sign is the slash, which looks like this, and not the one that goes the other way. Now, when we have formulas set up like this, if I change a number, for example, let me make this 87, notice how the profit and the total and average changes. Have a look at it again. Let me change the number to 97. The numbers in these columns change. And that's how you can start to see how dynamic these formulas are and how we can change them depending on the situation. Also, if I go back to cell B4, let me change something else over here. So the 47, let me make that 57. The number changes. We don't have anything on the right yet, so it won't change anything over here but sometimes we see negatives, and that's what happens. When you see a formula in Excel, you may want to duplicate it in adjacent cells, either across a row or down a column. So there is a formula in cell B5. If I double click on it, we'll see what's happening. When copying a formula in Excel, it's important to remember that you're copying a formula relatively. So let me just copy the formula from here. So I'll press CTRLC. Formula is copied. And let me just paste it over here to CTRL V. I paste the formula by pressing CTRL and V on my keyboard. Now let's see what happened in the formula. So I have moved one column to the right, and the column reference has changed from column B to column C. If I keep Copying the formula across, the references will be changed to column D, E, F, and so on. You see, if you copy a formula, it is adjusted relative to the original. Otherwise, you would be repeating the exact same formula, which does not quite help us. And of course, the benefit is we don't want to type a formula here, then here, then here. Imagine if you have to do this for every day in a year. That would be ridiculous and time-consuming. 
and we can simply copy a formula by dragging and entering it from the lower right corner. This is referred to as the fill handle. As I drag to the right from the fill handle, you'll notice that these values are correct right away. So in May, it's 21 minus 28, which is minus 7. So one by one, we've got the right formulas. And if we had even more columns, you can imagine how time efficient and better it would be by just copying the formula across using the fill handle. Similarly, now in column N, we need to calculate the totals. So if you look at column N3, we are summing all 12 months. So the formula is working on the 12 cells to its left. So if we just drag this formula across, we are mimicking this relationship for the other two rows as well. So for expenses, the formula over here is working on the 12 columns to the left and same for the profit row. The basic concept is the same, but I'm moving down a column. Similarly, the average function is the cell to its left divided by 12. We want to do it again for the other two rows. So I'm going to go on the cell, wait for the fill handle, and I'm going to drag it downward using my mouse. If you remember, the worksheet originally began with very few formulas, and we have added more formulas by dragging the fill handle downwards or across. The list of numbers on the screen appears to be a random collection of numbers at first glance. The rest are all formulas and not numbers. You'll need to copy formulas as you work with Excel, as demonstrated in the examples in this video. In this module, we have seen how to use the mouse and keyboard in different ways to make simple formulas. Once you have created a formula, copying and pasting it enables you to save a lot of time, especially when you're dealing with a very large data set. Once you have created a formula, dragging it using the fill handle enables you to save a lot of time, especially when you're dealing with a very large data set. You can use Excel's most common functions, sum and average, to add up numbers in a column or a row, or find the average of those numbers. Now, you can use these functions with the help of a menu button or shortcut keys. We'll be exploring that further. What we see over here is a worksheet with numbers. Let's say in cell N3, we want to add the revenue from January through December. So how do we go about doing that? You may have seen in a previous module that we can start by typing equal SUM, left parenthesis, highlight the data, and so on. But there is a better way, a faster way, or even two faster ways, in fact. Firstly, you can find the AutoSum button in the editing group on the right-hand side of the Home tab. When you click on this button, Excel looks up for data and then it looks leftward. No numbers show up above it, but they do show up to the left. When we click this button, Excel tells us what it's going to do and we press enter. After you've used it a few times, you'll feel more comfortable with it and be able to speed it up a bit. We can double click on AutoSum to do this as well. So let's see how that works. Let me delete this. Click, click. And there we go. So what did we get out of this? As a reminder, we can see what it did if I double click this cell. You can also see it in the formula bar in cell N3. So it's summing B3 to M3. We can apply the same concept over here in cell B10. I click auto sum twice. Now let's say we, we want to add these cells over here. So I can highlight the data over here and press Alt and Equal from my keyboard. And that's another quick way of adding the numbers up. Let's do it again. So I delete this. I highlight the cells that I want to add, and I press Alt and Equal. And the sum of these four numbers is 954. 
that we see over here. If we go on the auto sum button again, you will see that there are various options. We have sum, we have average, count numbers, max, min, and there are some more functions as well. So if we change this to average, you will see that automatically Excel can now calculate averages. So the average of these four cells is 239. Let's apply the same approach over here. I select average and then I press enter. And there we go. The average is 79.5 for these 12 numbers on the left hand side. There's one more thing that I would like to tell you. You should never type SUM in a cell. Why is that? Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's okay to type SUM, but when you press Alt equal in Excel, it automatically types SUM for you. And you can change the ranges based on what you want to do. So if we want to add these three numbers together, by pressing Alt and equal, I get SUM and I just change the range. So why type SUM when you can just press Alt equal and Excel does it for you? So these are useful tools for working with formulas in Excel. There's no question that most Excel users use the sum and average functions a lot. Let's explore another commonly used function in Excel. If we scroll downwards, we'll see that there is another data set where we have the employee first name, employee ID, department, and the breakdown of the total salary by month. If you're just starting out with Excel, you might not need it right away, but you probably will at some point. It is called VLOOKUP. It works with another function called HLOOKUP, and as of August 2019, VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP will be replaced by a new function called XLOOKUP. And the whole point of this kind of function is to let you gather information that is related. You may be working on more than one worksheet at the same time as you do this. In this example over here, we have some employee data with their total salaries. And you can imagine it to be a very large data set with thousands of rows of data. And what we need to do is to find the first names based on the employee IDs. So if we use the XLOOKUP function, it will make things much easier. In addition to combining the features of VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP, XLOOKUP makes some new improvements and gets around some of the problems that we have had with the other two. I'm going to type equal X lookup left parenthesis. And if you have never done anything but sum and average, you might be surprised by what you find. If you type in the name of the function and add a left parenthesis, you might get a hint about what you need to do. And if you want, some extra features that are between the brackets. When you type in X lookup, basically what you're trying to do is I have a value like the one over here. So I'll click on the lookup value. Then I need to identify a lookup array. So that, that will be the employee ID column. So I'll select all of it. And then I will type in a return array. So if we want to find the first name, that's in column A. So I'll select the entire column A where you have all these rows of data. And that's it. Right parenthesis, enter. So the first name of the employee with ID 12 is Florian. So we can drag down this formula. And this is what we get. But what happened here? We are getting an error. And why would that be? If we look closely at the formula, you see that these ranges are dynamic. So the ranges are changing as you drag the formula downwards. If in cell T23, we had B22 to B98, by scrolling downwards, we are at B23 and B99. And if we click on the formula again, the range has an empty row that it's looking into, which is not correct. In a nutshell, you want to make these ranges static. So what we can do is, if we go back to the original formula in cell T23, 
we click on the range and we press F4 from our keyboard. So you'll have these dollar signs. You do the same over here, press F4, and the same for this range and the next range. And there we go. Now drag the formula down and you don't get any errors. So ID number 12 is Florian. We can do a quick check. Yeah, that's correct. That's Florian, ID number 12. Sanchez, ID number 6. That's Sanchez, ID number 6. So we have easily populated the first names by looking up the IDs. Now let's do another example together. So we need to find out the total salaries and we just have the IDs. So I'll just start by typing in equals x lookup left parenthesis. Then I'll click on the lookup value. Then the lookup array, which is this column over here. I'll select the whole array. And then I need to find the return array, which is the total salary. So I'll select the total salary. Right parenthesis, enter. Let's make these ranges static by clicking F4. I press enter again. And I'll just drag the formula down. So these are the total salaries of the employees with these IDs. In this module, we discussed some more time saving Excel techniques. We explored the autosum and alt plus equal keyboard shortcuts to sum a set of numbers automatically. We also explored XLOOKUP, which is a far more powerful function of Excel when compared with the more commonly used HLOOKUP and VLOOKUP functions. Values like interest rates or other percentages can be put right into a formula, but almost always it's better to get a value from a cell in your worksheet. Putting a value in a cell instead of putting it in a formula makes the value visible and lets you change it without having to change the formula. So in this module, I'll show you how to use cell references. We have a spreadsheet over here with monthly revenues from January through December for fiscal years 2020 and 2021. And we need to fill in the revenue numbers based on some requirements that have been laid out. Let's say I want to show the value of a particular cell. In this case, we need to find how much money was made in January 2021. So when I look at my list, I can tell that the value is in cell C4. I will go back to cell F4 and type my formula there. In this case, you only need to do three things. The first thing I need to do is type an equal sign to show that I'm making a formula. Then I'll click on 258, 421 as a reference in cell C4 and press enter. This is the value in cell C4 and that's what we need. If I want to use more than one value, I can choose the cells. Let's say I want to find the total for quarter four. That's between October and December. In F5, I'll type an equal sign, then SUM, which stands for the function sum, followed by a left parenthesis. And then I simply go in my data set and select the cells relevant for Q4 that is October through December, and hit enter. If you notice that the cell closely, there's also an error indicator because I didn't include all of the values around the ones I chose, but you don't need to worry about that. I can do the same thing with Q1 and Q4. I'll begin by typing equals SUM, left parenthesis, I select Q1, that is January through March, right parenthesis. So I've selected cells B4 to B6. I can type in a comma, 
and then I'll select the Q4 months. That is October through December. Right parenthesis, enter. If you look at the formula closely, you can see that I have two ranges. Each are highlighted in a different color and separated by a comma. To calculate the total revenues for the entire 2020, let me show you a quick way of doing this. I'll begin by typing in equals SUM left parenthesis. I'll select cell B4 and I'll press Control, Shift, and Down arrow to quickly select the entire data set. Enter. And the total revenue for 2020 was in excess of 4.2 million. This technique saves time because you don't have to drag the formula using your mouse. Last but not the least, I can also choose values from a horizontal range. Let's say I wanted to know how much revenue have we made in the month of September for 2020 and 2021. So I'll click on the empty cell over here and I'll start by typing equals SUM left parenthesis. I'll click on cell B12 which is the month of September for 2020, and I'll drag this across. Enter. Let's now discuss what happens when you copy formulas and show you how to use relative and absolute references to keep track of what changes and what doesn't. You got a glimpse of that in the previous module, and we'll discuss it some more in this module as it's really important. If we scroll down below, we have some headcount related information for a global corporation. This workbook tells me that this corporation had 21,020 employees. The projected growth rate is 3% from 2016 till 2024. So what would be the headcount numbers from 2016 through 2024? If I want to make that formula, I will start by clicking on cell B25. I'll type in the equal sign. I'll select my starting headcount amount, which is 21,020 in B24, and I'll put in an extra 3% on top of the initial amount. So I'll do plus and type B24 again, multiplied by the growth rate of 3%. Right parenthesis, enter. So in 2016, the headcount number would be 21,651. Let's say I want to drag the formula in cell B25 till cell B33. To do this, I will click on cell B25 and then grab the fill handle at the bottom right corner of that cell. It looks like a small square. I will just drag down the formula to copy it and I get something I did not expect. If there are a lot of number signs, there is a mistake. In this case, the value won't fit into the width of column B as it is now. I know that's not right because the numbers in cell B26 till B33 should be around the 22,000 mark because the formula should simply add a 3% growth rate on the ending value of the previous cell. So if I click on cell B26, let's see what's happening over here. We have the starting value which is correct. I want to add the growth rate on top of the starting value. So if I see what's happening here, it takes B25 again, which is fine. And it's multiplying it by the original headcount rather than the growth rate. So it seems by dragging the formula down, the ranges have changed. So how can we fix that? We first correct the formula by selecting the growth rate. And I'll hit F4 using my keyboard, and you'll see some dollar signs appearing, which makes this range static. I'll press Enter, and it, this looks much better now. The headcount in 2017 is 22,300. So by hitting F4, the ranges are absolute. But there's something else I wanted to show you. If I hit F4 again, there's just one dollar sign before row number 23. So this makes the row static. If I hit it once more, there is a dollar sign before column B. So this is making the column static. If I press it once more, 
the dollar signs disappear and the range is not static anymore. So in a nutshell, you have a lot of flexibility here, but you need to be sure what you want to do. Do you want to make the column static or the row? For now, let's make both the row and the column static. So I'll hit F4 again. And there we go. You're back to 22,300. And now if I drag the formula down till cell B33, the numbers look much better and the formulas are working. And by just glancing at the data, you will note that the formula is indeed correct and it's working. In this module, we took a deep dive into the absolute and relative references. Remember, in Excel, it's not just about typing in formulas. It's about working with addresses when we talk about formulas. You can save a lot of time using the F4 button on your keyboard, especially if you're working with large data sets. Time for an exercise. This exercise will have two parts. In the first part, we need to identify the employee ID and the department from table one, in which we have the employee ID, department, and the employee name. And we need to identify the ID and the department using XLOOKUP. That's the first part of the question. In the second part, we have the initial investment amount and we have the investment rate. And we see that the formula has been applied to cell B52 and B53, but then from cell B54 onwards, there seems to be an error. So we need to look into the formula and correct it. Please pause this video if you do not want to watch the answer right away. Starting off with the first question, let's use the employee name to determine the ID and the department. We just need to know how the XLOOKUP formula works. So we'll begin by typing equals XLOOKUP. We're going to select the employee name as the lookup value. Then for the lookup array, we are going to select the column with the employee name in our table. And for ID, the return array should be the employee ID column, which is column A. We're going to close the brackets and we're going to hit enter. And there we go. Before I drag this formula down, I need to lock the cell references. And I can do that by pressing the F4 key on my keyboard. So C7 is locked. C42 is locked. Same for A7 and A42. I'll hit enter again. And now I can easily drag it down. So the employee IDs have been filled. Now for the department, I need to apply the XLOOKUP formula again. So I'll type XLOOKUP. I'll select the lookup value as the employee name. I'll select the lookup array as the employee name column. Then for the return array, I'll select the department column. And there we go. Right parenthesis, enter. Before dragging the formula down, I'll lock the cell references again. So I'll press F4 for the cells I want to be locked. I'll drag it down. And now I have the ID and department per employee name. For the second question, let's first have a closer look at the formula. So in 2016, to calculate the final investment amount for 2016, I have the initial investment plus, then I have the initial investment again times the investment rate. So it looks good. In 2017, again, I have the investment amount in 2016 plus the investment amount in 2016 times the investment rate. That's fine as well. So what's happening in 2018 onwards? I have the initial investment amount for 2017, which is correct. Then I have the investment amount for 2017 again, which is correct. And then instead of multiplying it by the investment rate, which is in cell B50, the formula is multiplying it by the initial investment of 1.15 million, which is not correct. So I need to fix this part of the formula. Instead of the formula referring to cell B51, I need it to refer to cell B50. So I'll fix this part of the formula. B51 becomes B50. That's fine now. And then I can drag this formula down and fix the rest of the cells. But before I do that, I need to lock cell B50. So I'll hit F4 and that's it. So the investment amount in 2018 is 1.256 million, which makes sense. And I can easily drag the formula down 
And there we go. The error has now been corrected. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To see the full course that this video came from, click over there. And click over there to see more videos from Simon Says It.